Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Commander Clash podcast, where the Commander Clash crew discusses Commander-related topics. Today, we're going to be discussing utility lands, and to discuss utility lands and put them in a sweet little tier list, uh, I have the Commander Clash crew with me. We're going to be starting with Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive. How's it going? Good. How are you today, Tomer? I'm doing well, doing well. I love tier lists, and I'm actually really curious to see what everybody's hot takes are on these particular utility lands. I don't have I hot mean, takes, we, Tomer. We have, well, that, that's the voice of, of the Asian <laughs> Avenger, also known as Krim. Uh, no hot takes whatsoever. This time just cold. The the no hot takes person ever, Krim, also never has enough mana to use utility lands, so let's see what my ratings are. <laughs> Not like you're going to activate them anyway. You know what am I going <laughs> to activate them? Yeah, right. <laughs> And then the hottest of takes uh, always, always comes from uh, the site owner, Richard. How's it going, Richard? Hey, what's going on? I, I have the hot pocket takes today. Hot pocket <laughs> takes. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, Richard's got meatballs always. He's always got meatballs. Yeah. So, so the format with this, as always, is we take all of the utility lands that are popular in Commander slash uh, we personally play a whole bunch, and we've graded them uh, between D to which is the lowest and S, which is the highest. So, how we grade it, the the, the rough criteria for it. Uh, D is don't play. We don't run these in our decks, and if we do see it in our hand, we try to discard it to gamble or just just not run it. Um, C is average. C is not a bad ranking, by the way. I know some comment section are like C is terrible. No, C is just average for us. We consider it uh, a mediocre filler card that we may run due to certain restrictions, such as budget restrictions. At B, we have cards that are very good, but only good in certain decks. So they can be fantastic in a specific archetype or maybe two archetypes, but you're not gonna find them in your average deck that can run them. Next up, we got A, which is really good overall. These are cards that are good or exceptional in a large percentage of decks. So you're not gonna run an, as an auto-include in every single deck, but you're going to probably want to run it in a lot of them. And then finally at S, these are our auto includes these are cards that we're going to be running in basically any deck that can run them and we have to have a good reason why we won't run them so they're going to show up almost always so that's our ranking guide and as always you can also find the full ranking list we we ranked what like 38 or 39 utility lands. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to talk about like the, the, the most 10-ish interesting ones. Uh, but you can find all of them uh, linked in the video description if you're seeing this on YouTube. Or if you're checking out the article, you can find it there as well. Um, and then now the last thing we got to do before we jump into the cards themselves, we got to do uh, two things. First of all, if you want to support the channel, is you can support us monetarily by buying all the beautiful playmats that are stapled on the back of Richard's wall. You can buy deck sleeves and tokens and even clothes uh, from the MTG Goldfish merch store. And if you want to support this channel and help the channel grow, you can also uh, like and subscribe if you're listening to on YouTube, or if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple, just make sure to like it or do whatever equivalent there is over there as well. It always helps uh, grow the channel and, and, and make sure that we're keeping to do these in the future. All right, so with all that out of the way, uh, let's start with our, our most interesting cards to talk about. And we'll kick things off with Richard. Uh, what's the first card that we want to talk about? All right, uh, we're starting with Temple. Of the false god so it's a fairly old card um you add two mana but play this ability only if you control five or more lands so you have enough lands otherwise it does literally nothing <laughs> <laughs> so ranking wise uh we have c for b d for seth and krim and then c for tomer i moved it i moved it <laughs> Uh, B B for Tomer. <laughs> B. Oh, this this is B. Wow. I didn't thought it would be. Wait, so okay. what specific e. what specific deck do you like this in, Tomer? I'm I'm curious. Okay, so hear me out. So so for a long time, the the running trend. So in the beginning, in the beginning of the official commander format, which was 2011, over a decade ago now. 
Uh, Temple of the False God used to be an auto-include in most decks that I came across. People would be running it everywhere. And it shows up. It, it used to show up, at least. Uh, not anymore. Thank you, Wizards of the Coast. Uh, it used to show up in, like, all the pre-cons. Um, not so much anymore. Um, so it used to be, like, a staple in the format. Then over the years, I would say like five years ago or even perhaps even longer, people started considering Temple of the False God is actually a bad card. Uh, because, you know, if you don't have five lands on the battlefield, it doesn't tap for mana. So it's a dead card. And then afterwards, it starts tapping for two, which is really good. But if it's, if it's a dead card, that's really bad. So people started saying it's, it's an unplayable card. It's trash. It's, it's garbage. You don't play it. So I was wondering, like, I was in that camp, too. I was like, this card is trash. It's always been trash. I've been a hater since since before it was cool, you know? And I was, like, advocating for Wizards of the Coast to never add these to pre-cons anymore. Um, but then I actually sat down with uh, a person who has a PhD in a math, uh, has, a, has a math degree, Frank Karsten from Channel Fireball. And I asked him to do just like run the stats. And I'm not going to go through all the all the the way we found all that information. I have a link uh, in the video description. It's also an article if you want to read about that. Um, but the conclusion that we figured out, counting rampant growth effects, which is uh, lands or spells that ramp you a uh, land uh, that cost one to two mana. Um, the odds are, if you have like let's say. Uh, you have like 30, 35 lands or, or like 36 lands. That's including lands plus rampant growth effects. That's a 75% chance that you're going to have a Temple of the False God on turn five uh, that's going to be, you know, activating for mana and you won't have to cast it. You won't have to play it earlier than that for zero as a dead card. And then if you bump that number even higher, like 42 lands. So again, this is lands and rampant growth effects, which are common in green. Um, if you have if you have 42 of those, like let's say 38 lands and then uh, an additional four rampant growths, that goes up to an 85 or 86 percent chance that is going to actually work the way you want it to work out, which I think if it's an 85 percent chance, I think it's actually really good. So I, I've reversed my situ my my, my uh, thought process on it. If I'm running a green deck that's heavy on land ramp, I think Temple of the Fuzzle is actually a really good inclusion. If you're not a land ramp heavy deck, though, it becomes much worse. Um, and I wouldn't run there. So why I put it as a B is I think it's actually good in green ramp decks. Bam. <laughs> hmm. Bam. I mean, <laughs> in, in green ramp decks? Yes. <sighs> Do you but, even need it though? Like in green yeah, ramp decks, that's you have the main like thing. the green castle. You have ancient tomb. Like, do you really got to play this? Like, even in the optimal situation, it's gonna pretty much just screw you over. Like one out of every four games, five games, six games, based on the math. Like, is it? Do you do you need it? Like, is a reward I, enough in 2022 when you have multiple lands that tap for multiple mana? To play a card that's just going to hose you some meaningful percentage of the time, even in its optimal build. And plus, it's I not like know. green needs the help on accelerating <laughs> yeah. or the ramp. The worst because... is if you have this forest and then ramp and growth as your opening hand or like Kodama's <laughs> Reach or something. And then you're like, wow, yeah, but... you know, I just got my face wrecked. Um, so yeah, but... I actually agree with Toma, right? The math is sound, right? The, the math is like, I think it's worth 15% hosing yourself. But that is 2013 magic, right? In 2022 mm. magic, you are playing Urza Saga, which <laughs> takes you down to land, right? Yeah. You are playing Cartographer's Hawk, in which case you're incentivized to take down your lands as well, right? Like all the white ramp is contingent on you reducing the number of lands. And, Why would you, know, you run Cartographer's Hawk in a green deck, though? What? Why are you but, running a Cartographer's Hawk instead of some rampant growth? Like, well, no, no, no. But you... So this, this is a universally good card, right? You could have played it in all color decks, right? But now you just nixed all white decks. You nixed all Urza Saga decks. You're down to like a very narrow set of decks. And if you're only going mono green, like mono green does not need more mana. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the decks you actually want to run this in are like black decks or something, right? Like if you don't have your coffers combo up, you can't ramp as well as other people. You want to play Temple of the False Gods, right? Blue decks, things like that. But I think with all the utility lands going on that, you know, incentivize you. Like white, you know, white used to not ramp. You needed this. Now you don't need this anymore. 
right? It's like risky and you have other things you can do to help you. You can make treasure tokens in red. You know, there are things you can do to ramp yourselves now that you don't, you don't need to YOLO Hail Mary <laughs> the Temple of the False God, right? So, so I actually think it's gotten worse over time. Uh, okay, uh, I think so it's you, like stone unplayable. I, I mean, I, I looked at my deck list. I like to check and actually see my commander deck list when we talk about these cards. The only deck list I can see back to like 2016 where I have this card in my deck was precon decks where I actually like copy and paste <laughs> the entire precon. Like those are that was it or a couple of viewers submitted decks. So I literally have not played the card. My argument against it is uh, I agree with what Richard is saying. I also think that fast man is less impactful in most decks if it's not coming on until turn five. Like ancient tomb on turn one when it lets you play a signet when otherwise you would be passing is incredibly powerful ancient tomb on turn five to get you one extra mana up to six it's not bad you're never going to complain about extra mana but it's much less impactful than turning on earlier so the fact that this is never going to do anything until later in the game makes me only really like it in very specific archetypes like colorless decks with big eldrazi as a commander okay i can get behind that because i'm actually trying to get to like a 10 mana commander or something like that but otherwise i don't know i just i don't play it and i don't really see the the reward being worth the risk even in the decks where it would theoretically be on by turn five most frequently seth absolutely nails it <clears throat> that's that's it right there like it I just feel like Ancient Tomb, like, I can get down with that. Like, if, if people are like, oh, if you like Ancient Tomb, what's wrong with this? Exactly like Seth mentioned, the early turns, Ancient Tomb allows you to set up a lot more. Like, oh my god, it's so good. And late game, I guess it's like, sure, additional mana. But this this card is only additional mana uh, at the late game, and it's 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 best case scenario <laughs> requires me to have five lands. That's, that's quite... Quite so, like probably towards the mid game, right? Like, this is the so, worst crim card. <laughs> yeah, this, this is should be lower than worst yeah, for you, Grim. <laughs> I would never play it in a crim deck. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> I played also, this card like two, three years ago. Yeah, like before Urza Saga and Bounce Land Mania and stuff, and like playing white. Like I used to play this card. I think it's decent. But, like I think it's not like you know crazy like S tier, right? But I think ramping is the most powerful thing you can do. And even if you ramp on turn four or five, like it's still good. Like it's a free commander cast, right? Like. Commander tax, right? So I, it's I good. Like I, I'd be happy if Tomer played it and then I like copied it with Vesuva <laughs> 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 like later, right? Like I, yeah, I you that didn't result. use a deck slot for it. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I, I think these answers kind of highlight exactly why I think Temple of the False God is so misunderstood. Like I just told you that it gets dramatically better in decks that run ramp cards that put additional lands onto the battlefield. And you guys are just listing a bunch of decks where it's statistically less likely to be useful. Like you're the, the, the mono white decks, the, the colorless decks, the, the black decks. Like unless you're actually running a land ramp, these statistically speaking, Ooh, by the math, it Would you got, play it, it in worse. non-green decks? No. I would play it in non-green decks. Four years ago, <laughs> right? Like, right, and, I, and that's like, why it's it does worse so I because think it's people good, do right? run it like that. Uh, so, so here is here is the the biggest argument against what I think you're saying, Tomer. If you're playing a deck with a ton of these green ramp effects, you need basics. In playing, I, I I honestly think there might be an argument. I just ran out of basics the other day. Last commander, check out next week's commander clash because or whatever. You will see I me run out of basics. That's the thing base. that happens. <laughs> what do you do if, if you're base? running a ton of ramp? It grows. Don't you need the basics to support that? And doesn't that also make Temple of the Falls got a little bit worse? Because you wouldn't you rather have another basic to tutor out than a land that might tap for two mana? Running out of basics is essentially like making less mana. I don't I don't get it. I don't I don't see why my green because deck. Because you runs. run like five basics in like a mono green deck. I don't understand how you do it. You have to go out of your way to run such few basics. I run I a lot it of basics. Mono green. Like mono green is so strong at this that it like the 15% of the time you can't cast your three mana, two mana, or four mana ramp, like, is very detrimental to your overall game, right? It's but not even mono green. It's like Simic decks, even Selesnya decks. Like, Selesnya deck, I'm not running those catch up white cards. Like, that's like, that's preposterous to but me. You like, are running I'm running Urza Saga. I'm running Urza Saga, sure, but I'm running Rampant Growth, Far Seek, Three Visits, Nature's Lore. Those are the ones that are locked in first. Um, then if I, if I'm feeling a little bit feisty, I'll run like a Kodama's Reach, a Cultivate, you know, like I'm focusing on two and three drop, 
uh, land ramp. I'm not running Knight of the White Orchid in a Selesnya deck. I'm not running Cartographer's Hut. I'm, I'm not running okay, those cards I, I at all. This. I'm going to try running this deck in every non-white deck. Or this card in every non-white green deck decks. this season. Green decks. No, no. I, I think your argument for green is like the same for every other color, right? My, my main no. argument is the returning lands to hand, right? And I, I okay. want to see how it plays out. Because I'm actually curious. Like, I so, think... But like... Because if it works, this is one of the greatest power boosts to your deck ever, right? Like a free ancient tomb, like yeah. <laughs> so ramping right? growth for for the for the stats here for what Frank Carson explained. I don't want to go through all the all the map because I'm probably going to miss her presented. But he said, like statistically speaking, a ramping growth effect, something that ramps you a land out on turn two, counts as a land for the purposes of this thing. So you actually want to have specifically land ramp for these cards for, for, for Temple of the Falls God to work. And like, just imagine if you ramp twice or if you ramp one time, that means you can be getting your, your Temple of the Falls God not on turn five, but on turn four, right? So so like you're actually like each time you're land ramping, you're boosting the the speed at which you actually get that value out of the Temple of False God. It's not like a turn five and afterwards always thing. If you're if you're adding in land ramp, uh, then it actually gets online faster than that. The, the problem um, is commander is played not on turns, but on mana. Right. So if you soul right. ring into signet, you're effectively on turn like four or whatever on turn two. Right. Right. In which case your temple of the false god is looking very sad. <laughs> right. So right. Like, you gotta count overall mana you have access to in terms of turns, right? But if this if we're talking like high power games, obviously I wouldn't run Temple of the False God because like if I'm playing high power, then I'm running all the fast mana and I'm running like if if I don't if I don't have three mana on like uh, if, if I don't have like at least a mana rock on turn one or something like that, like what am I even doing at this point? So uh, in that in that situation, Temple of the False Gods obviously terrible. But like at mid power games, what we play at, I think it's 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 much better than people give it credit for. And I think a lot of people are using it very wrong. Like they're using it in the opposite decks that they should be. I think and that's somehow why disagree getting... and agree with Tomer at the same time. <laughs> I think it's underplayed, but for like all the wrong like the different reasons than Tomer is no. stating. <laughs> All right. Well, that that's interesting. And also, also, I will say one more thing on it. One more thing on it. But people say like it's stone cold. Like if I see it in in my starting hand, it's a feels bad. But you can say that you could replace that with a five drop. Like you could say like, oh, this five drop in my yeah. starting hand feels really bad too. There's no real difference. Just treat it as something that you can't play. You know, on the first turn, and it, it, it psychologically it feels a lot worse because you know it's a land, and you know, oh, if it was only a blank, I could have played it on turn one. But if you but if you see a five drop, you don't make that same connection. You're not like, oh, if only this five drop was a land, I could have played that instead. It's different when the five drop wall is a well five drop and this is a resource. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Because this is a resource, I do care, right? Like it's way different. If this were an MDFC, sure, I'm on board. But because MDFCs. Temple of the False Gods is a resource that <laughs> changes the entire plan. This does not, yeah. I, I will not look at it as a five drop because it is big sad, right? And and a 15% fail rate is pretty high. <laughs> like, keep in mind, I would not want to drive a car that has a 15% chance to blow up, right? Like, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's a five drop that costs zero. So it's like such a t big tempo game. Like if you play like a rampant growth and then you turn four Temple of the False God and now you, you've essentially rampant growth twice but for free. I and, just don't and you immediately get to use that, that mana. I, I mean, I don't understand why Mono Green cares enough to play. Like, it already ramps. Like, what does the Temple of the False Gods do, right? Like, I I would... They're probably already plus 50 turns, right? Uh, like, by the time this is online, they're, the, everyone else is on turn one. They've already got, like, six mana, right? So, so the thing here is... I just don't see the purpose of this card in a mono green deck. I don't. I mean, I could understand it more from Richard's point of view, playing it in a white deck that constantly bounces its land back. But actually, no, I can't. That seems terrible there too. <laughs> yeah, we, actually, we hold on. Yeah, like it's blue. Actually, wait. It's blue, just black, bad. and red decks. <laughs> But no, the, no, no, because blue, just, black, red decks, the best uh, three colors in magic, are very <laughs> color intensive when it comes to spells. Yeah, that's so, true. Like, but, two, two, like, there are just some decks, like, why don't I run Ancient Tomb everywhere? Because two colorless and the two life is painful at times. Just, so, but, hmm. just imagine this scenario, so though. You, already. <laughs> just imagine this scenario. Turn two, you cast any rampant growth effect. Uh, ra sure. Rampant growth, far seek, any of those. Any of those. Mm -hmm. Then turn f so you have now you have three mana on on, on turn, turn two, two, but you're tapped out. Right. So turn three, you can cast a four drop. You do whatever you want. 
Yep. Uh, turn four, you play Temple of the False God. You have now five lands on the battlefield. You have six mana. Like, that's insane on turn four. I feel like isn't that play looking at the best case scenario yeah, in like, the best archetype? What about the, like, how about this scenario where I have, you know, three lands in hand and no ramp spell, this mon- and then I, like, you know, I play this land that does nothing and can't cast my cultivate. Yeah, like, on average, this card feels underwhelming. You, and and well, let, okay. let's say we get to turn four or five, right? And, and then, like, you just named the best case scenario. Or I have a normal land that could be a channel land. Or, like, you know what's funny? Like, this land doesn't... Is this even utility anymore? Like, I feel like by 2022 standards, this is slowly... It's already pretty low for me, but the fact that it also doesn't do anything, I'm starting to get spoiled by all the lands that are coming out. If I put I a know, hundred land deck... This would be in it. I would. I would. Then, <laughs> then I know I'd be I good. Like, Otherwise, <laughs> I, I can count off the top of my head like eight eight green ramp cards that you're probably running in all your green decks anyway. I have no green. And decks. then you'll. <laughs> okay. Well, fine. Uh, but, but the point I mean, is, it's not. This? There's an opposition agent on the battlefield. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. I, I right, guess this is a pro for example because it's ramp without searching. But then you couldn't unplayable. actually cast your ramp and growth. So <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, leave a comment down below. I'm, I'm uh, curious. Do, do you still play Temple of the False Gods? No. I think I think basically nobody does. And I was a I was a big hater until really? after because everyone down has Frank one, Carson. right? It's in precons, right? So you should yeah. probably they no, no longer <laughs> No long and that, these, these I, I last week that's don't what have stopped them. people from playing it though. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it wasn't because they just stopped reprinting it into all the sets. I was a hater until I, I sat down with Frank Carson. That's what that's that's all I'll say. Well, we got to move on. We got more cards. Oh, all right, next up, we got a we got a double whammy. The Richard double whammy, you might say, with two lands that can copy other lands in Vesuva and also Thespian Stage. So Vesuva just ETBs as a copy of a land on the battlefield. Thespian Stage, uh, it comes into play tapped, I should say as well. Thespian Stage comes into play untapped as a colorless mana, but you can pay to and tap it to copy another land on the battlefield. Uh, these are lands that I think, where, where are the ratings on these lands uh, now? Do we have them rated together? The Thespian Stage, yeah. we have SS. I should rate it the same. Okay, Thespian Stage the same and card. Vesuva, <laughs> they're, they're rated the same. Me and Richard gave them S's. Krim and Tomer gave them A's. I will say these are two lands that I didn't really think much about in Commander. I would play them in like, oh, I'm trying to turn on Dark Depths or like very specific narrow situations. But then Richard, a couple of years ago, maybe longer than that now, started playing them in every deck and it just completely won me over. And now when I build a Commander deck, uh, even if I'm playing five colors, these are the lands that are going to make it in my deck every single time for me they are the the true definition of s tier that i put them in every single deck i play and i think they keep getting better because wizards keeps printing lands that are more powerful than temple of the false gods that actually tap to add multiple mana without all the hoops to jump through uh richard always has dousing daggers that are flipping into lands that tap for three mana there's bounce lands Uh, so you can usually get a lot of value out of them or someone plays uh herborg and you can copy their cabal coffers and use it for a bunch of bad there's so many things these lands can do that i absolutely love them but uh what do, what do you guys think okay um i i have it at a i this this makes it sound much worse than it actually is but but, but it's i don't the reason why it's not an s for me is because at the same time it's still something that requires me to kind of like have something on the board right somebody has to have a land that is useful right or 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 it's just a colorless land that could be i don't know a random mountain island whatever it is right so if it weren't for the like if it weren't that that's the only reason why i've knocked it down to an a it would be an s if i didn't have to do that because i like having making making sure that if it enters play uh it kind of does something or on top of that or it's a channel land or any of those effects so i i do i do love this card it's very good it's very good i just don't like having something that requires everyone else to have something for a resource. Okay. You, you okay. can clone later with Thespian Stage, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you can clone later. Right. And, and then, like, I, I, I agree. I agree. You can definitely do that. And the floor is pretty much like copy a dual land or whatever, like you said. Like even the worst case scenario is like, oh, I got to tap dual land. Like it's not exciting, like getting, you know, whatever, some ridiculous utility land. But still, it's it's hard for it to ever really be that bad, I think. Depends on like lower curve decks. Like let's say if I play my rogues deck. Or I play, you know, my ninja deck, any of those, right? 
I don't know if I want, like, any kind of tempo deck. I don't know if I want to spend the mana to turn my land into that when I could be playing a two-drop, right? So maybe, like, I have two-drop Spell Pierce, two-drop Swan Song, right? I, I can't afford to have the colorless here and there. Uh, so there are situations in tempo decks and lower to the ground decks where I may not want that. Um, this is a great okay. card to have in the late game when I'm, like, flooded, sure, or whatever. And if I'm going to have a land, may as well have it be a land that can copy anything, right? But... Low to the ground decks, tempo decks. I may not want that early. So, not that this is bad, by the way. Still a very good card. A's is like you put it in most decks, right? So right. It just means you're not putting it in every deck. So I, I play and this in Birds, which is a curve out deck where I don't even play Soul Ring. Because. Oh my God. The, the upside <laughs> is so great, right? Because you can copy an Ancient Tomb, you can copy a Field of the. You can, like, whatever you personally think is S tier for lands. You can copy. And in the worst case, like Seth said, it's a dual land for you. And in the very worst case, it's a colorless land, right? So, like, the, the downside is so minimal. But, like, snagging an Urza Saga, right? Snagging anything, like, a, I don't know, a Maze of Ith or something to stay alive. Like, it's actually insane, right? And we're not talking about dousing dagger flips into, mm-hmm. like, the most tedious of, like, ramp you've ever seen, right? So, I... Do not see why you would never put this in a deck. Like the, the downside is so little for the upside, and it only gets better. And it gets better with the board state, right? Because you can strategically choose what the best land is and what to copy, or even hold. Like you can just hold the Suva and you're like, I'll just wait until that coffers comes down and then I'll take it. Right. So yeah, I think this is the truest of S. Like, never gets cut. Hmm. I so I, I actually didn't rank any, spoiler, I, I didn't rank any of the lands here as S. Um, I, I would say these these two uh, are among the ones that I would, would put in the most decks. Uh, but again, I, I also don't put them in, in every single one. Like there's some five color decks where I just don't, like I, I, I value the mana fixing so much. Then you got a um, second try and- in, Tomer. But isn't it mana fixing? Sure. Other I, yeah, it's kind of like it, mana it kind fixing of too, in a weird way. Yeah. It kind of is. You copy I, your I had, opponent's duels, right? Like yeah. So so that was my thought process. Was I, I, I have a five color deck, and I put the Suva and Thespian stage in the deck. I don't have I don't have Dowsing Dagger, or I don't have any like special shenanigans to get the value out of my deck. But the idea was that like you know they count as like budget budget reflecting pool or whatever where like the thespian stage is colorless but you can pay an additional two and tap it so it's like a three you need three mana essentially to copy something but i felt it was just kind of slow and then vesuva vesuva was a little bit closer i that was the one i kept in my deck longer because it enters the battlefield tap you don't have to you don't have to activate it you don't have to invest three mana essentially into it you just do it immediately or invest two mana rather it but again, it just kind of felt a little bit too clunky, so I, I ended up cutting it. But like, anytime, like I run a lot of white decks. This is like my favorite white land, or what? Some of my favorite white lands. You copy Lotus Field, you copy a, a Bounce Land, you copy a Dowsing Dagger Flip, or whatever. Uh, it's very good. It's it's you always copy. There's always something decent to copy from your opponent's stuff. But I do feel like there is there is some slowness. There is a trade off to it where it is a little bit slow. And if your deck isn't isn't the one that can really abuse it, I feel it's not good enough to be like, oh, well, I hope that my opponents have something good that I can copy and therefore will justify having a slower land in my deck. If, if your deck has something that is worth copying, then I run it for sure. But if my if it's just my opponents, I don't run it. Which is I'm kind of with Tomer right there. Uh, like And yeah, like it's, again, not a bad card by any means, but like just some decks I feel... It gets a little awkward when you have that early. Oh, nope. Seth and I are... St- st- still an A. The upside is still an A, by the way. The upside, though! Okay, that, there's so much upside, and you upside don't have... Insane. And you don't have the downside of doing nothing. Like, that that was my issue with Temple of the False God, is the downside is, like, literally do nothing. It's a complete dead card. Like, these cards, the upside is higher than Temple of the False God. Like, you get a land that taps for two or three mana. The downside is, okay, I got another dual land or whatever. So I feel like the, the floor is so high that it's hard for me to imagine it's, ever cutting these from any deck. It's another dual land, but at the cost of potentially taking the turn off. Yeah, it's a tempo. It's a tempo loss. It's like it's like yeah. the the same thing with like 
talking about bounce lands. Like they're not just free value. You lose tempo when you're when you're casting them. Like if you play a thespian stage and you needed that, you need colored mana to to cast a spell that's not great and then when you do want to copy something you still have to invest two extra mana and tap it to copy it and then you'll use that the next turn right because it has to tap itself so so it's not like you have to tap itself that might change it a decent amount but i mean yeah and and vesuva just comes into play as something like they're the only draw yeah, but it's that comes tapped. In, well yes but we play plenty of tap there's plenty of tap lands as he play is that really a deal breaker for the for the immense upside of these cards i don't know richard sold me i mean i i still run it a lot but it, like i look still, at it as a, a bounce line like <laughs> i run bounce lands a lot but they enter the battlefield tap like there's, there's still a, a trade-off bounce right? lands though have astronomically gotten astronomically better with mdfc's and channel lands, so and and catch up lands. Suva is light. another bounce land. <laughs> it is, it's like again, <laughs> it's whatever yeah, is the you, best you card of the turn. Everything. Magic meta game is. I think that I it is a it is almost s. It's played in so many things except for yep. decks that care about tempo. Like so again, yep. like I, I think that it's very good. Anytime I draw it after turn five, but if this is a card I see before turn five, I feel kind of sad. Oh my god, you just compared it to Temple of the False God. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but Temple of the, the False turn Gods five can... meta, it's good. <laughs> Temple of the False right. Gods is like not good ever. <laughs> like like for me, like <laughs> just a minute, just a minute, Krim. You love Temple of the False God. I don't, I don't, I don't actually. I, I actually oh, what's up next? What's up next? All right, what we've got coming in next is well, of course, none other than Seth's favorite, Tomer's least favorite. Uh, <laughs> at least for emotional reasons, it's Strip Mine. <laughs> <laughs> so. Strip Mine is a pretty, pretty powerful magic card. Uh, th- like, let, let me see. Let me pull up the list again because it's... Where is it on here, actually? Yeah, okay. So, Strip Mine, essentially, just you can tap it... Or you can sack it to blow up a, a, a land, right? It doesn't matter which one. You just tap, sack, destroy target land. doesn't matter if it's basic, it's non-basic. Whatever it is, you can pick it off. The, the thing here is... I don't know. Everybody's got it rated fairly, what... Like pretty high, I guess. A like so. Richard's got an A. Seth's got it S. I've got an A. Tomer's got it about a C. Uh, and you know, I'm I'm kind of curious <laughs> why C, Tomer. So I so if you asked me this question like five years ago, I would say it's an S. Obvious is an S. You have to deal with all these problematic uh, lands that you can't you can't otherwise interact with, right? Like. If somebody has a maze of it in your combat deck and you're like, well, what am I supposed to do? The answer is strip mine. And I like it because I also liked it a lot in like uh, white decks with catch up ramp because, you know, you go down land, but it doesn't feel that bad because, you know, you could just cat you could catch back up. I've I've had it in almost all my decks before and now I. I don't have it in a single deck anymore. And I looked at the recent commander clash decks that I've been bringing. I don't have it in a single deck because. I've just swapped strip mine out for Vesuva and Thespian stage. Like instead of dealing with a problematic land, I'll copy it. And a lot of a lot of the decks that I ran that used to require strip mine to answer lands now have access to answers to them that I much prefer running. Like if you're in green, you have Beast Within. If you're in white, you have Generous Gift. If you, uh, I guess, if you're in red, you have Chaos Warp. You you have ways outside of just Strip Mine to deal with lands if you need to. And then if it's a land that isn't like super problematic, that's like shutting you out, but it's just like super powerful, and then it's like a Feel of the Dead or something like that, I'll just copy it and I'll be like, hey, I have Feel of the Dead too now. Yay. <laughs> we both win. Yay. And I don't make an enemy that way either, too, right? Like if you strip mine somebody's Cabal Coffers, they're gonna they're gonna hate you. But if you just copy their Cabal Coffers, they make insane mana and you make insane mana. Yay. <laughs> uh, so that that's why I have it as C. I just don't run it anymore in any of my decks. It's so good. I, I love strip mine. I got it as you know I know go. there was a time when I didn't play it much. That was because it was banned and then I forgot about it. But now I remember it's unbanned and it's now it's back in every deck. Vesuva, Thespian Stage, Strip Mine, Mana Fixing. That's all you need every time. And the thing about Strip Mine, sure, it's a way to deal with problematic lands. And we keep getting more of those. Wizards keeps printing powerful lands. I don't really want to spend my beast within on a land if I can help it when I could do that with a land. But the underrated aspect of this card 
part is it's a political implication. So like you can go a long way just threatening people with strip mine. It doesn't work with Richard. Richard is is wise to this trick and he's like, oh, you're really going to go down <laughs> a land like you, you wouldn't do that. But with everyone else, it's actually a very potent political tool that you can just leave it sitting on the battlefield and threaten people. And you can get a lot of value just out of the, the threat of this like mutual destruction of uh, of land. So I think that it's even better than just destroying problematic lands because you can actually parlay it into a lot of value politically. I, I don't like going down lands. You, but, <laughs> but I'm at an A. Like, I think the value <laughs> of this card has gone down over time. Um, you know, we have even like the new uh, Boseju, right? Like you have ways of dealing with uh, lands that are problematic now. And, you know, I, I always say you, you should never snap this thing off on turn four, right? Like this is like the most horrendous use case, right? Someone plays a value land, you have to let them have it. You can't unramp yourself, right? But you use it as mana, and then on turn eight or something, when there is a maze of it preventing you from winning, <laughs> you snap it off to, to finish it, right? Um, Vesuva works, but usually Vesuva, you're copying something from someone else's deck who probably is built around whatever you're copying, so they're going to do it better <laughs> than you. Right, if they're like a landfall field of dead deck, like you can both have field of deads, but they're gonna win, right? Or if you're trying <laughs> to attack and they have a maze of it, like you having a maze of it doesn't help, right? So you True. you do need some way to deal with it. I I agree with Tomer, we don't play it as much, and I think he's correct. Like you know, I I often don't play it because I'm greedy, uh, but there you know every game there's a problematic land on the battlefield and someone needs to deal with it, and if we all ran strip mines, we'd probably be better off. Just like don't turn to strip mine the bounce land. Like, yes, you got him, but you also got yourself. <laughs> so I'm not sure you made totally it. Totally worth it. Totally yeah. worth it. <laughs> so yeah. I, that's valid. I, I also I also skipped over like green crucible worlds and stuff like that, you know. But, yeah, um, actually, and you know, Richard just mentioned this card is going down in value over time. That time is like within the last 15 seconds. I had this at an A, uh, and I'm now moving <laughs> it down to a B. Uh, no. Because, to be honest with you, all right, it, it's weird. I I had it. This is a card that I think would have been very powerful a while back, but now that there's just so many good lands, I just feel like sacrificing my one land drop to like try to stop one of 50 because like every land is a problem to me now uh like oh, sacking my one land just doesn't feel good enough anymore like the loss of tempo feels really bad uh and and but i do think that it is needed like some effects like these are still needed but maybe in the right kind of deck you can really you're okay with losing the land and setting yourself back much like uh you know you had mentioned like uh someone mentioned earlier but like some kind of crucible, I think Tomer mentioned crucible of worlds, maybe some kind of like hate bears deck. Sure, you can afford to do it there where you function on a lower curve, but I can't imagine my like my dragon deck who is also color intensive wants to play a strip mine <laughs> set itself back when it's already, you know, trying to play six and seven drops that are like colored sources. Um, and when it comes to utility, it's upside does not seem like it does enough to me. Like, even if it's stopping, like, a Cabal Coffers Urborg combo, which is still very good, I just don't think it's good enough to warrant me playing this and setting myself back a land. Yet. I think you guys kind of convinced me as well. Like, <laughs> Are you going to D now? Oh, no, you're going to no, D. No, 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 no. no. Crim, Crim, Crim kind of uh, brought up the points that, that I agree with. Like, I, I when, when Seth said, you know, he'd rather not use, like, a Beast Within... And he'd rather strip mine instead of use a, a beast of to deal for problematic land. I'm the opposite. Like I agree with Krim. Like my land drops. Like I don't want to be wasting a land drop because it's not like a land that you just you channel and you waste it and you still play like a forest or whatever for your turn. This is you. You've played your single singular land for that turn, and now you're down a land forever for the rest of the game. But like I understand that like late game. Uh, if there's something that's preventing you from winning the game or something that's going to win the game and you need to stop, uh, copying it is not as good of an answer as just, like, dealing with the problem. Um, so I I bumped it as a B. And also, like, if you're, in, if you're in a green, like, landfall deck, which is, like, the archetype that I play the least, so I didn't even think about it. But, like, if you're in a green landfall deck where, like, you play more lands than you might even have, like, in your hand to do and you have, like, a Crucible and Ramming Up Excavator, mm -hmm. uh, then you have Strip Pine gets fantastic there. So it's, like, an all-star there. I just don't play that archetype much. Um, 
And I, I do agree with like with with Seth and Krim, the like or Seth and Richard that like sometimes you just need to deal with something to win to to not lose. So and sometimes you just need to send a message. And strip mine is the best yeah. land for <laughs> Seth is about sending messages. We're doing that. Yeah, we're losing. You gotta uh, let you gotta let people know. You gotta let people know. You're not safe to play that bounce. You're not uh, safe. Well, you do it once, and they'll think about it for the next whole season of Commander Clash. You'll have it in the back of your oh, mind every season? time. I still think about the strip mine commandeer, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> and I that, still think about that. And that wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a strip mine in my deck. So, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Kept Tomer honest. <laughs> Five year trauma. Thank you, <laughs> Seth. Uh, all right, move, moving on. Wow, we got through only four cards. Um, uh, oh, it's on me. Hello. Uh, we got the Castle Cycle. These are the uh, Throne of Eldraine uh, rare lands. Um, each of each of them are monocolored, or they're they tap for one color, and then they have an activated ability. All of them are, are lands. They enter the battlefield tapped unless you control a basic land of their corresponding color. Uh, they tap for one colored mana of their corresponding color, and then they have an activated ability. So, for example, Castle of Ventress, it's the blue one. Um, it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control an island. It taps for blue, and you can pay four mana and tap it to scry two. So you're essentially like investing five mana's worth of mana uh, to scry two. Um... But I would say the strongest of the bunch is the green one. Uh, this one, you pay, you invest five mana and you make six mana. So you're actually, you net one green mana uh, in the process. And you can spend it only to cast creature spells or activate abilities of creatures, which is not really that much of a restriction because if you're in green, you're probably pretty creature heavy. At the very least, you probably have a commander that you can cast with this. So this takes you from five to to six. So it's literally ramp. Uh, and yeah, it enters the battlefield untapped usually because you'll have a forest. It's has for a color. So the, the, the floor of this is pretty high. The ceiling of this is exceptional because you're basically speeding up a, a, a full turn of uh, a, a ramp for that. I don't know if the other ones are that good. I don't whoa, know. What do you guys whoa, think? Slow oh, your oh, roll, Tomers. <laughs> pay life. The draw card, pay life equal to a number of cards in hand. That's not very good. That's I, good. I play that. Are you I play black? Black, black is like wait, wait, black, wait, wait, and, <laughs> black is right behind green for me. Like wait, green wait, is wait, definitely oh. one and then black. Yeah, black green are the so, two playable ones. So Seth and, gave this an A. I gave yeah. I, the cycle, the entire cycle. Seth gave this an A. Richard and Krim gave it a B. <laughs> Hello, C. Tomer the hater of lands. You know what? I'll put it as a B ratings. just for the green. I'll put it as a B as a, for the Depends green. How you the rate green one is the only I, I one I'll play. The two good ones are Bs, and then the rest are just like. So what are what do you guys think are the the good ones? <laughs> okay, so I think green, they're all bees except for the red. Ooh. Green's number what one by far. Do? The red one, red is pay three sure and tap you. it to tap everything. Yeah. Oh, like a bushwhacker, oh, red aggro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's like one of the better ones. That's like my second favorite. What? Green what? number one, black number two, okay. white number three, red number four. Blue number five. That would be Blue my are rating. The and, bottom. and like tier, so just tier like, wise, I would say like green and black are both like uh, green. I think is S tier. Black is like high A to S tier for me. Uh, okay. And then the other ones are kind of like B to C tier. Uh, just to clarify for the for the audience, the green one is a, f a four mana and tap to make six green uh, for only creatures. Blue is four mana and tap to scry two. The black one is pay three mana and tap to draw a card and lose life equal to the number of cards in your hand. The white one is pay four and tap to create a one one human creature token. And the red one is tap three or pay three and tap to make creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn. So, so my tier of that is uh, green and black split the top. Uh, they're both about like a strong like S right there. And then blue and white get about a solid A. And then the steep drop off is at like the red one at like D. <laughs> like, so, or, okay, yeah, in all creatures. honesty. Crim never has creatures, so that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, no, like you that, put the green one at, at S, right? Oh. Yeah, I think the green one's very good, right? Like, despite, you know, it being in the most miserable color, it is still a very good <laughs> card, right? And and the black one you can play pretty much in any deck that plays black. Uh, but the, the white one, I guess, 
by functionality, I, I guess the white and blue are more B than anything else because the the white one's only really good in humans and or token decks. The blue one, okay, so if, if a scry is half a card, you scry two, you pay five to draw one. Uh, and in, in a control <laughs> deck, right? But in a control deck where you function at the end of people's turns, I will pay for that. Because if I'm not doing anything, because people, what they'll do is, oh, well, if he has open mana, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play anything. Okay, well, I'm gonna scry then. Right, mm-hmm. and and so it just like for control decks and, and things that operate on a flash uh, kind of axis, I think that uh, the blue one is actually pretty decent. Just being able to scry to to dig towards something is better than probably blinding blindly drawing a card in some matchups in some decks. I, we're we're all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we're I sure. Think what, how do you do it? Black and green are A's. The other three are D's. Maybe C's if you feel in general, but like. <laughs> Who who's paying five mana to scry like whoever gets to the state in the game, right? Like you're already so dead. Right? And like are you paying five mana to make like a a one one? Like even if you're a token deck or human deck, like what are you do like I'd rather play a plane, right? Like so <laughs> and like the red one of like really like that that plus one plus one team pump is the difference maker. Like I, I don't think these effects are strong enough. I think the, the green and black effects are strong enough and warrant uh their their mana cost but the other ones i'm like i literally don't like you can play your commander how about that just cast your commander again instead of sinking all this mana into this quote-unquote utility right so i i don't think they're worth the the cost oh the blue one come on in a blue deck most blue decks operate on a a flash axis so you can wait right the waiting game is amazing like but the, uh, like if, it was scry two. <laughs> like it was <laughs> uh, scry two to dig towards a a better answer or a win con or some yeah. I don't know. Like like there's there's a lot. I'd run it in like hmm. scry for a better I'd run answer. Exactly, Talran. Like a mono blue draw go deck is like the only deck I'd run Castle of Ancestors, and I'd run it and it'd be like it's fine. I run I it in like mono the, or two color decks, so. I, yeah. I have it in pretty much any two color deck that I, I would play just because it's, I know it's that it's like it's like in a very small percent it. of decks and it's so mediocre when you yeah. use it in those decks as well. It's not even like, you know, it's like in one deck, but it's like S tier in that deck. It's like, no, it's still like quite mediocre <laughs> when you do it, right? You probably don't want to but be it's doing it. Better anyway. than a basic. I, I mean they mostly come into play on tab, so right. like, yeah. usually. And yeah, the, the, the Mystic like, Sanctuary doesn't turn on because you have this. I don't know. Like, oh, no, it, this is, yeah, is this is island? like why, this is why, like, I think, like, when I keep saying you should run more basics, it's because, like, I, I think you just stop running mediocre utility lands. Like, oh. the, you could just have more room for for basics, right? Oh, what if like, I want to so scry, Tomer? I might want to oh. scry, too. I'm empty What if I want to run you I think that I always have the opposition agent because I'm digging for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would put Castle Garenbrig an S in, like, a lot of green decks. Green heavy decks that have creatures, which it's is like, like Temple of False God, but good. It makes mana yeah. before turn five, oh. and then it's oof, it makes colored <laughs> mana. I would I would put I would put Castle Lockwain, the black one, maybe at B, probably a C. And then the other ones I I would run like in the most I wouldn't run the white one ever. If I'm paying five mana to make a, a human creature token, then I'd rather just not play that deck. That sounds like a, I'm You're already lost. Undervaluing <laughs> the ability in a token slash human deck to end of turn make a one one. That is obviously going to be better than a one one. If, if I if I'm in a token deck and I just Pass the turn with five mana up. I've already lost the game. <laughs> no, but you're like, not there's... committing cards, right? In a token deck, you get blown out by a sweeper. But I'm not draw go. I'm trying to no. win the game by killing you of tokens. I'm not trying right. to be like but you, mm. you apply enough pressure, right? So you apply enough pressure. You make a few enough tokens, right? So then you hold your cards, and then for the rest of the turn, okay, well you're not going to sweep. I'll just I don't have to commit more. I don't. I'll just sit, uh, sit here and just keep making one ones. I'd rather or be I'll just drown yard someone before I try to make one one tokens. I, I, I'd rather to just have a someone. planes. I'd rather have a planes because that's oh. one more land I can get with land tax. One more thing yeah. I can get off sort of the animus. Like I, it's I'm not also gonna, a like, land that's not helping your Ameria, right? Like yeah. Or wait, do they have the types? I don't remember. They no, do they, don't. they don't. They don't. They don't have the right? types. Yeah, they're so not basic. They're 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 like if you're like oh in the late game in some hypothetical. I'll activate this and it'll be really sweet because I couldn't do anything else with my mana. It's like, sure, and that'll happen. But like nine, 
I don't even remember. I, I've played Castle of Art. I've played most of these, and I don't remember the last time I've ever activated half of them. Castle Garenbrig I did. Castle Lockwain is actually useful, and it only costs four, but, like, you're going to lose a lot of life, and that, that stuff adds up, so I'll run it sometimes, but not not often. Like, if I, if I, again, if I'm if I'm hell-bent, then I've, I've built my deck wrong. You know, like, if I have zero cards in hand, and I'm activating Castle Lockwain, I've built my deck wrong. Why why don't they have a full grip? We're, what Something more serious has gone wrong than I'm being like, oh, thank God for Castle Lockwain drawing me a card for four mana and losing life. So Lockwain can draw you into, like your Eldrazi or your two card combo and can, can do something such that you end the game, right? And but to that extent, like eight life off it or to, something. to that extent, the know. blue one at least gives you hope that you draw into something <laughs> useful. The white one makes a one, one like, like who cares? Like this is not in a saving token, you. In a token in a human deck. Yeah, in a You're token not deck. spending five mana in a token deck to make a one, one. <laughs> when you I lost, have you draw lost the game if you're doing that. why your graveyard's always empty. That's because I kept pooping one ones that you were <laughs> pooping on. So, oh, and then you can pay another guess. one mana at the skull glam. If you're paying five mana to make a one, one in a token deck you've lost the game you end of just turn it up at make this a one All one right. instant speed i, I like no. I, come on that's value run basic land. I, I can't believe Krim is championing the white weenie yeah. run basic land <laughs> there there is is value. Land. Oh. everybody's saying oh where's the room for basic lands i need to run my well this is why because you're running castle ardenvale in your white deck oh, it's good. It's good. all right it's next good. up we have uh dryad arbor uh, Dryad Arbor is a a land. It's also a creature. <laughs> it's also a one one. Uh, it has the type forest, so it is a forest dryad. Uh, so if you if you haven't played with this card before, it has summoning sickness. So if you play it, you can't tap it, uh, and then it dies to removal. Uh, so the ratings are B for Richard, D for Seth, C for Krim, D for Tomer. I hate oh, Dryad care. Arbor. Oh, I hate Dryad. <laughs> it it, oh, it seems like a good idea. You're like, okay, I got this Green Sun Zenith deck. I'm going to do this cute thing where I cast my Green Sun Zenith and I get my Dryad Arbor and it's ramp on turn one. <laughs> but what happens is it always ends up in your opening hand every single time. And then you're stuck playing it and your land doesn't tap for mana. And by the time it's unsummoning sick and can tap for mana, someone kills it. I swear this happens to me like literally like 90% of the time. It shouldn't mathematically, but it does. So I just refuse to play. I refuse to play it. Even in decks where it seems like it should be good, like those Green Sun Zenith, it's not good for me. It's like how I can't win a coin flip. I can't win the Dryad Arbor ever be on summoning sick and make a mana flip. It just, it, it's never going to happen. Never going to happen. Absolutely hate I, it. I, even without the biases that Seth has had with the card, I still think it's very... I'm a little bit higher, but I, I, I will say that this card makes it so board wipes hurt you even more. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. And then on top of that, the fact that if you ever have it in your opener and you can't use it as a resource feels really bad. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I do think that it does have its home in like random uh, decks token that like decks. there's like token. Okay, token. Okay, token <laughs> decks don't need this. They need Castle Art and Veil. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's just say like you have some kind of like equipment Voltron deck. Sometimes you do. You can just get an end of turn target. I value the <clears> ability to fetch and get threats at instant speed so just because it is a and it has the smallest chance of becoming a threat i give it a c i give it a c but otherwise 99 percent of the times i would never want to play this i get board wiped it, it feels even worse because not only did you kill my creatures you killed my land on top of that so i just i don't want to be here <laughs> so bad homer <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I was waiting this. for. I was waiting for Richard to talk. Like, I, mean, I okay, could go. I could go. Go for it. Okay, I'll, I'll list the use cases for this. Right. So, Green Sun Zenith for one. You, you pull this out. That is what ninety nine percent of players wait do with for this. zero for zero. So, yeah, uh, well, so one, one mana, mana. You Green Sun zero yeah. for zero, and you pull this out. Okay. Uh, so here are some other hypothetical uses. Okay, someone attacks you, the big scary thing, you crack a fetch, you fetch up a dry arbor, you block. Okay, uh, good old modern staple. They Liliana you, you fetch this up, save your bogles. Uh, how about this? It suits up a dousing dagger. Does that make it any more legit? <laughs> okay, so how you're about saying this? End of turn you, threat. And, or you, you run into threat. good. You have a Toski, and you can use yes! the dry arbor to draw land. Toski. 
right? So do, yes. do all these little incremental things plus the actual use case <clears throat> of Green Sun Zenith, uh, you know, for zero, X equals zero, is it worth it? I think it is, right? Like just the Green Sun for zero, I think is enough. And then you have all these weird fringe cases that you can do something useful with. Like green, like you, you know, if you overrun, well, your dryad arbor is now bigger or, you know, whatever, right? Like green has a lot of conditional <clears throat> creature card draw. And this is another creature, so maybe it's like okay. <laughs> all, don't all those fringe upsides also apply to the Castle Ardenvale token that you so were so vehemently against a minute ago? That cost you five mana. That cost you five mana. That cost you five mana. How does no one understand? <laughs> I did not have prim defense Castle Ardenvale on my commander. I don't know how Kurt doesn't like this week. the false god because if he's like, I can I spend five it mana. Was just no it was five five mana to make a one, one, one value. Vesuva, uh, a turn five. <laughs> Castle Ardenvale, turn five, tap I, out. I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, I, I think it's a, I think it's a B for all the reasons that Richard runs. Uh, I just don't run a lot of like lands matter green decks. And if I did, then I would I would run this highly. But like personally, like I I understand the value of it. It's a very good card. Have I ever cast Green Sun Zenith and have I ever played a deck with Green Sun Zenith and Dryad Arbor in the same deck? I think this is my my CDH Edric deck. And like I understand it's good in CDH. Uh I just this is not it's not my style of of deck, so I don't run it that much. But I I can't say in good conscience it's less than a V because I just don't personally run those decks. Like it's just it, it's good utility, and yes, it, it it does like if you put it in a random green deck, like a green deck that's not like land land heavy lands matters. I think it becomes a lot worse because you're you're risking a land drop. Like I said, I I don't like wasting land drops that can just die on a win. That's why I was against strip mine. But, like, if you're in a deck that, like, you know, poops out lands, then one of them being uh, a thing that can die to a board wipe is totally reasonable because of all these extra synergies that you have. So, yes, it's a B in decks that I just don't play that much. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's all I got for that. All right, next. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. I, don't want, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to talk about Ryder Arbor anymore. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm done all with right, that. All right. Next, next Here's... up, we have War Room. I think. I think. All right. So the War Room is a lane that I actually consider like just the better Castle Lockwain nine times out of ten. If you actually want to use its ability, um, and it's I actually took out Castle Lockwain from my my black deck to run this. It's a colorless land. So you can put it into any deck. It, it enters the battlefield untapped. It taps for colorless. Uh, you can pay three and tap it. Pay life equal to the number of uh, colors in your commander's color identity to draw a card. So if you have a color identity of just, you're like a mono colored deck, you're like a mono black deck, then you lose one life uh, while activating this. Um, if you're a five color deck, then you lose five lives. Don't run it in a five color deck. To me, this is like what Castle Lockwain should be, and I will actually run this over over Castle Lockwain in a mono black deck, and I, I do. It doesn't tap for colored mana, so that's his major di- downside. But you're actually not going to lose that much life. You're going to lose one in a mono color deck, and that's Why you basically run both? because I just I just don't care about activating this that much. <laughs> like I I've run these cards enough to know that like when I do activate them, I'm in desperation mode, and I just. Don't run. I just run more card draw. I just you should be I, desperation I find myself mode in a, with a full grip, right? You should be no cards in hand, desperation mode, right? Yeah, but why? If I if I'm I refuse to play decks that regularly have no cards in hand. That's that I refuse. What? Where? Why would I be doing that? Why am I? I'm here to play Magic Gathering. And even, Magic Gathering even, drawing cards. Even with a full grip of so, cards, I would still be so. So rating wise, and... I gave it a B. Seth gave it mm. an A. Krim gave it a B. Tomer gave it a C. It's a traditional C. I really like this card. I feel like it is auto included in mono color. I feel like it's close to auto include in two color decks, and I think it's fine in three color decks. Once I have to pay four life. And I need more color fixing because I'm four colors or five colors. That's when I'm not interested in this card. But I actually think that 
paying three life and three mana and tapping a land to draw a card, like that's pretty reasonable. And it's great. As you said, it's a better Castle Lockway. And although I just run both of them because I value card run basically any form. And the, one of the ways I make sure I'm not the person with no cards in hand is by playing any lands I can that can actually draw me cards. Like that's a good way to make sure you have cards in hand. You got a little extra mana. You, you know, you couldn't spend it all on whatever you were doing. Being able to pay three to draw a card is a really powerful effect. And I think it goes up in value even more in some colors that maybe struggle a little bit with card advantage, like mono. I think this was like the best mono white card of the, you know, it's release or whatever. Like, it's so good for decks like that. So what about Eldrazi decks where you don't have a color at all? It's free. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Then, I mean, you, yeah. you you can't really run a lot of basics anyway. Well, you're going to fill your entire Waste. deck with wastes. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, great but for like, colorless. I think I, I don't know about three colors because at three colors, I'm taking that kind of damage. I also want it and I'm spending that much mana. I do kind of want it to produce some color in some way shape or form but in two colors or less i could definitely see that going in there and like i i see no re like i don't think this is a card like it's like either or you don't need to choose this or castle locked i think you play them in the same deck because yep. redundancy right why not have more lands that give me actions at all points of the game um so like so basic lands no i said action. i want basic action. lands action. i know i know so like, like, why uh, why run both I'm like, i want basic <laughs> lands i like basic <laughs> lands you mean mdfc is <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> like, like, so so yeah, like this card is really good. Um, in, in in those decks, so if if you pretty much play two or less colors, I highly recommend this at least be one of your lands. So I agree with you guys. I have a question: If you are playing mono blue, would you play War Room? Yes, mono blue being 100%. a color that does not have trouble drawing cards because it is a colorless land. Any any deck, I don't know, whatever. Just like yeah. If you're playing blue, you have access to ample card draw. Would you play a colorless land, uh, you know, non-basic to, to do this? 100% yes, just like how I had mentioned Castle Art and Veil. If I don't have to use any of my cards to do anything and I could just use a land, I, if I'm not forced to commit any more of my hand to do so, like, I can save this card draw spell for a later point. Or maybe when I need to actually cast a spell. Just, like, I, I think that's why I would play it. It's it's the exact same reason why I love Castle Art and Wheel. If I don't have to commit more threats and I can just sit here and do this, then I will. Until I force you to answer it, right? So, yeah. I love this, regardless. Can never have too much card draw, even in a, even in a blue deck. Like you can just never have too many options, and the opportunity cost is just pretty low. So I guess like what your Mystic Sanctuary doesn't turn on or whatever, like as quickly. But really, the cost seems low enough that yeah, I would play this even in a blue deck, even in a blue deck with a lot of card draw. I would still run it. Resounding no for me, but I, I run it in the same deck site as Krim. It's just that I. I like Krim usually runs draw go decks, and this is the deck that I would run it in draw go. Like when I was comparing it to Castle Lockwain, I run War Room in exactly one of my decks right now. I took it out of like my Boros decks and Mono White decks. I kept it in Toshiro because Toshiro is a draw go deck. Uh, I just want to save, keep all my mana up, and then I'll either cast an instant speed draw spell or instant speed kill something. Um, so War Room works really well for that because if I'm not if I'm not casting any of my spells, I can just draw a card with War Room and I lose one life. Castle Lockwain would regularly make me lose like five plus life and that didn't feel worth it to me. But War Room losing one life makes a lot of sense. But like if I'm in a tap out deck or I just, I'm not going to run War Room. I, I used to and I just took them out because I, I'm tapping out. I'm not I'm not. I don't want to be in a position where it feels good to uh, invest four mana to draw a card. Like if I'm doing that, then because I'd it, I should be always be able to cast my spells that are higher impact. But I mean, like with my no mana, one, no one wants to be in the position where you got to pay three life and you know three mana to draw a card and to have a land, but like. You end up there sometimes. Isn't that just like what happens yeah. in a hundred card singleton format? So I think it's a nice hedge for when things do go wrong. This gets you a couple of cards deeper to maybe find more card draw that gets you back into the game or something. So, so it's, it's I never a bad a thing lot. to have an op like putting yourself in a situation to have actions at all points of the game. Right? It's like yes, the absolute worst case scenario is what, yeah, you're out of cards, you've gotten blown out from some sweeper or something like that. Sure, right? But now you've got this land and it's still doing something. In early game, you just don't have to use it, right? Like you just just don't use it. But the so thing is nice knowing that you could. I'm mixed on this, which is why I asked you guys. And I think I tend to agree more with Tomer on this. So 
the reason is we play this card a lot, right? Like, you know, we, we put in a lot of our decks. How many times do you recall someone activating a war room? Like maybe once or twice through like multiple seasons of Clash. Like sitting around and doing nothing, like is not very common, right? And the problem is it's a colorless utility land, which you could have replaced with a different colorless utility land. Right. Or you could have run a basic or something. So like to me, it's opportunity cost. Like, yes, you know, if you just had one on the battlefield, you would use it. But, you know, like I like this is not commander from five years ago where we would sit around with like 10 lands each. And we're like, oh, what do we do now? Right. Like we have so much card draw nowadays and our commanders are so powerful that we just keep going. And I, I don't recall people just like sitting there tapping five man or whatever, using utility lands like game doesn't usually end up like that anymore. So that's why I question whether, you know, should I play a strip mine or should I play a war room, right? If I'm playing Thespian stage, like the worst hand is like strip mine, war room, Thespian stage. Well, that's a mulligan, right? Like, you know, you, you can't play unlimited colorless lands, right? So to me, it's opportunity cost, whether are we overvaluing war room because it's just a theoretical like free card or should we be playing like actual colors or something, right? Or basics like this. This is my whole. This is all my stick. Like you, you see, I haven't rated a single thing S, and I, I'm always rating lower than you guys, mostly, almost always. And that's because like I, I don't like these hypotheticals on like if I activate if this is going to be really good if I'm in top deck mode in a very late game because I, I mean, I, I have I've had these cards and I just don't activate them. And then the question is like when when you said mono blue, would you run this in any mono blue deck? Everybody's like resounding yes. I'm resounding no because I unless it's a draw go deck, I don't see myself activating war room and I'd much rather have an island because the island is going to uh, let me fetch it with sort of the animus. It's going to uh, fuel high tide. It's going to let me double my mana with extra planar lens and gauntlet of, pa and gauntlet of might and uh, cage sun which are cards that I do run quite often. So like when, when everybody's like saying like oh I don't have room for these basic lands. I think you do. You're just running like a lot of people are running utility lands that they never actually end up utilizing and th those are eating up to the basic land slots that you could be using oh my goodness i feel the the exact opposite i i just ran out of <laughs> ran out of basics in my ishin deck and my solution is i'm just cutting sort of the animus because i'm not cutting my mdfcs <laughs> i'm not cutting my channel lands get it out of here i want my utility lands <laughs> i get no that's right yeah. that's right <laughs> i agree that's with one fully. way to do it yeah <laughs> That's one I, way of doing it. Sort of the animus has now become a build around. Sorry, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's valid too. Like, if, if you don't want to utilize any of these basic land matters cards, then you just take them all out so you can run more utility lands. But, like, I don't it know. just, does it not feel weird? Just like, isn't it nice knowing that your lands, your mana base, one of the dreaded things that you could top deck is just, it does something. Like in the late game. Or, or yeah. let's say you're digging. These help dig. It's a psychological this thing, I think. Anymore, it just though. feels... But it yeah. feels good, Richard. It feels... It's like, like it a, a, a warm that. blanket like, like, of safety here five that you man, know. Like, <laughs> like the Ishin game, right? Like, you know, you're, you're in top deck mode. Yeah, if you had a war room, but like two other players are sitting there with 50 cards in hand and you're like, what is your... <laughs> what is your war room doing now, right? Like the game is usually ending by the time this happens. So I, yeah. I don't... I don't just value more. utility. Same with Ardenvale, right? Like, yes, if it was free and I could pump out one ones, but like, who's spending you know five mana on a turn to make a one one, right? Like, you know, there's like yes, a you kobolds are. of care keep. There's like ruins of care keep or something. You pay two mana and you tap it to make a kobold. I'll run that. But it, like, it doesn't have power mana. though. It doesn't have power. It, it it's who cares? One. It's a skull clam target. That's its only purpose. Human. What I care okay. about it's one all right, power. All right, all right, we're just gonna air out the here. It's a human one one. By the <laughs> oh, way, wow. I don't want to drop I'm that. On right, you all right here because you clearly did not know that because if you did you would be like Krim you're right this land is gas <laughs> is superior anyway everybody knows that all right what's what's next <laughs> uh seth what is what is oh, next next up I we think, have yeah is it me i don't even know anymore I think scavenger ground scavenger grounds next on our list a colorless desert land that comes into play untapped and you can pay to and 
tap it and sacrifice a desert so it can include itself and exile all cards from all graveyards. So as far as where this actually ranks on our tier list, uh, we have a C from Richard, a C from me, a D from Krim, and a... Oh, well, moving up to me from it. Tilmer. It just, it just jumped up mint as mint. I was reading those ranks. <laughs> Wait, I'm so can Okay, so Tilmer, you love this card more than anyone. Um, why, why do you think this card's so good? It's always me. <laughs> okay, because I, I recently had games where I was like, I was thinking about whether or not I should take out Scavenger Grounds, but it saved my bacon so many times at this point where it's like, I got to give it props. Uh Egg, instant speed exiling all graveyards like hitting your own graveyard sucks you know and it's colorless and i keep saying it's not a basic or whatever um but like i've had so many games where scavenger grounds that literally saved the game for me like it's impact is immediate where like i'm i was up against a cathrill deck and cathrill uh, just decided to do the Cathrill thing where, you know, you, you count up all the keywords in the graveyard and it becomes like a instant, it becomes a one-shotting, uh, indestructible hexproof, uh, creature that you basically, most decks can't deal with. And S Scavenger Grounds, being able to be activated at instant speed, three mana investment, it saved me so many times. And graveyard strategies are so popular that it comes up so often that, like, I, every single time I'm thinking about taking it out, it always saves my life, and I just I have to put it back in. And I had it at a C before because I was at the point where I'm like, do I would I want this over a basic land? And I was like, I probably probably not anymore. But then it keeps saving me, and I'm like, all right, well I guess I guess it has it is worth uh, the hype. Oh my goodness. That's, that's um, where I'm at. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at. But Homer, we have other things that can do the same thing that don't put you down a land. If you're going to give me that for my strip mine, I mean, well, could I you play something else? B. Uh, okay. okay. I put strip Pop mine as Seth. B. <laughs> Pop off Seth. No, no, no. Seth is I'm right. Saying I'm saying consistent. I feel like Seth. Scavenger Grounds is. It's fine. It's not exciting, which is why it's a C. Hitting all your graveyards, I think, is a is a pretty big drawback. Almost every commander deck I play want, has some form of graveyard recursion, and I don't really want to wipe my own graveyard. I do think people should play more graveyard hate, but I don't know if scavenger grounds is an answer. Like having to go down a land is pretty painful. If that's a mark against strip mine, I think it's a mark against scavenger grounds. So yeah, uh, and hitting your own graveyard is just a drawback, and it's colorless. So. I'm with Seth 1,000% here. It, well, I mean, like, I, as in I ranked it at D ex <laughs> because I do think that, yes, I strongly believe we do need ways to hate out the graveyard. This is not it. You're going down a land. It produces no colors. Uh, like, it's just not what I want at all. And, yes, it is nice to do at instant speed. I will admit that. But there's just so much, so many other things you could be doing now instead of that. I, I, I already knocked Strip Mine for setting me back a land. So there's no way I'm going to give this the pass, right? So that that's just generally it. I'm losing a land and it doesn't do it doesn't make colored mana. I I'm I'm not here for this. I can't do this. You gave strip mine a B. Yeah, but strip mine blows up an opposing like a problematic mm -hmm. land, which is like mm -hmm. okay, sure. But it's like a lower end but, of a B. It would be like a C plus. Strip, strip mine is one like it, you have to hold up strip mine and then you strip mine. This is you hold up yeah. 3 mana? 3 mana, yeah. Yeah, so I, I so honestly, this should be a D. I gave it a C because I was trying to be responsible and encourage graveyard hate. <laughs> and I'm like, you you would never do this because who's gonna sit around with like three mana open threatening graveyard hate? You're gonna tap out and you're gonna get destroyed by the graveyard player, and it telegraphs your hate, right? It's it's on board. Yeah. Graveyard player is like, hey, there's a scavenger yeah. grounds. Who should I remove from the game? <laughs> right? So you're, you're getting <laughs> murdered mercilessly because you have to do this. I'd rather just play Bajookabog and like, you know, play it on the turn yep. I need it, right? Sure, it's not instant I, speed, right? But, you know, neither is Scavenger Grounds in my opinion. No one's holding up three mana to like threaten this, so... And it's colorless, right? Colorless, <laughs> like I'd play Watch something else, step, right? Watch your step, Richard. I'm gonna this. blow up our graveyards right so now. I, I, I wish we had a better version of Scavenger Grounds. I really do. Uh, but like, like, it like, it has to be an instant speed graveyard answer. Like a strip mine. Uh, so it's like one mana, tap, sack it. Exile graveyards. Yeah, exile tar or target graveyard to make like not all of them or something. Yeah, like I would. That. I would it, accept I, I wish target graveyard. Maybe. This. Yeah. Yeah, but the problem is like 
for me, at least for my, it's this is a meta choice, but like I would say for people who are listening, count the number of times, like try to write down or, or recall uh, who wins the game and how did they win the game? Because a lot of the time, for me at least, when I'm playing, there people are are doing a combo that requires a graveyard loop. Like it, either it's like a blood artist loop, you know, um, or something similar to that. If that happens very often in your play group, or like somebody just like resolves an eerie interlude and wins the game, like Phil, like if Phil uh, had a less uh, had less disruption on his side, he would have won with an eerie interlude or something like that. If those are common occurrences, then scavenging grounds uh, value just goes up really high, and that's that's why it is for me. Like I wish this card kind of sucks. <laughs> but it feels like it's the best thing that we have. And that for me, the graveyard finishers or the finishers, the way people win the game are often these graveyard loops or mass recursion or something like that, where like you, you really need instant speed answers. And so like I grudgingly run this card. I <laughs> wish I didn't, but I do. And if 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 you don't have graveyard finishers in your uh, in your play group, uh then uh <laughs> that was my waterfall. Um uh, if, if you don't have graveyard finishers happening often, then don't run this card. Uh, but I give it a grudging B. That's that's my take. I, I think I actually disagree with Tomer, except for me that lands at a C rather than a B. Like I think if you are in a play group where you have a ton of graveyard decks and that's something you're dealing with, then sure play scavenger grounds. Like in that scenario, I'll I think it's it. worth it. But yeah, but yeah. You talk me down. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the C. I I still would. Oh, really? I, I would just literally run Graveyard Hate. <laughs> like, you know, like Raptors <laughs> I mean, play I rest or something, piece. right? Like, who's going to hold Soul three Guy mana Lantern. all game and police the board, right? Like, that's not I, happening. I put <laughs> Soul Guy Lantern's, like, in all my decks because it doesn't touch your Graveyard. And worst yep. case, it cycles for one mana. Yep. Yeah. Like, what else can you ask for? I right? mean, I guess that's true. We have a ton of cheap colorless artifact graveyard removal so now actually yeah. i'm gonna adopt, i'm gonna drop this down to a d you play the juke ball <laughs> and you have the with the tons of options and so many colors use your bounce yeah. land to return the bajuka bog you bajuka bog again so i, I, I run both yeah. for that reason i have soul guy lantern and scavenger grounds in most of my decks because yeah. that's just how i usually lose if somebody has a graveyard finisher anyway uh blah. what else what else do we got? oh oh we got a nice one uh, Krim, talk to us about a, a card that's quite relevant right now. So or we cycle. got a cycle that is, just came out with, got a secret layer drop. Uh, it's the Hideaway Lands. So for those that don't know the Hideaway Lands, they're like Windbrisk Heights. Um, there's, I don't remember the name of the blue one, but uh, like, yeah, you have... Sure, uh, Shell Dock Isle, that's the one where if somebody has less than like 20 cards in their library or something like that, you get to play the stuff. And then you, all, all the red one is like if you dealt seven damage this turn, uh, you get anybody, to, uh, yeah, to anybody, anybody you get to play the card from underneath. Uh, the black one, I just found out today, uh, what its name was because it's <laughs> just that bad, so just ignore that one. And, uh, like, yeah, so these cards just got a Kamigawa like kind of like makeover and they look absolutely gorgeous but the uh, community was a little lukewarm to like negative uh that's generally the reception on it and that then made me wonder like how many people actually still play this right and you know as weird as it sounds I still play these in occasional decks like I I still play Windbrisk Heights in my human deck I still play the red one in like some of my like like burn decks and things like that. And then of course, uh like the the blue one I don't really play that much unless I'm a mill deck and and then I don't play the other two. So, uh yeah, like I I think if I were to specifically set these out and like apart from each other, the white one I think is still a solid A, the red one's still a solid like like I would say like a B, and then the others are like Cs and Ds. So, I, I don't know. I mean, do you still play these cards? Because I find myself still liking the red one and the white one a lot. I feel like they have a very big drawback compared to most of the newer monocolor utility lands in that they always come into play tapped. So for me, now they got channel lands and now I got MDFCs. There's just so many things that are competing for these slots that like five years ago, I played these pretty frequently, but now I found them just most replaced by castles, MDFC, channel lands. I just don't have room anymore. So the white one in like a, a super tokeny build, I'll still play on occasion. Other than that, it's been a while since I've actually played any of the hideaway lands. B's for, for me and Krim, and C's for Richard and Seth, by the way. 
I don't think they're bad. I think they're just a little worse than like the more modern monocolor utility lands that we've gotten. I I agree that I used to rank these higher. I've put them as Bs now because in decks that can consistently like effortlessly activate them, I view them as basically balance lands. Like they're essentially they're they're enter the battlefield tap. They're not basics. They tap for uh, colored mana though. And their card advantage on a stick, and their card advantage with a mana discount on one on the card advantage. So it's much better than like you draw a card. No, you draw and you cast a card, and you can do it at an instant speed. Um, I still run the red one a lot because the red one is is super interesting. That you don't actually have to be the one who dealt the damage, uh, as long as an opponent was dealt seven or more damage uh, that turn. Like if you're in a, if you're in a deck, you should have a, you should be in a deck that can actually deal seven damage in a turn, obviously. But you can be sneaky about it, and like if somebody else is getting hit for seven, and you're you're you have nothing to do with it, uh, you get you get to basically pay one red mana and cast a spell for free uh, at instant speed, which is very sick. Uh, the white one, you have to attack with three or more creatures. In a go wide deck, that's super easy to pull off. And in a green one, I think it's ten or more power. Um, if you're in a in if you're in a, like a go tall style deck, like a Xenagos deck, this is again a freebie. Like I had this, it was an all star in my in my Xenagod deck because I'd make like I drop a five five, I give it haste and double its power, so it's a ten ten. It swings, and I'm going to cast a six drop for free with all of Moss drop or uh, for one mana or two mana rather, uh, green and a tap. So I find it in in particular decks are really strong, but I'm not gonna throw them as a random value uh, land in in a lot of decks. You know, like if I can't, if my deck can't consistently activate the hideaway thing, then it's just not worth it. I and the blue and the black it, are trash. They sound really good, but I don't, just don't play them. I don't know why. And okay, I got, should I just play a basic? But like, they're not that hard to hit, right? And if we're going on and on about like Temple of the False God giving you extra mana, right? Like if you hide away something that's like four mana, right? You just saved three mana, right? Like it's a lot, right? It should be worth yeah. it, right? So we should play more of these. You like also some cast it at instant speed. I, yeah. I think so you can also white, cast it at instant speed. The white and red ones are still respectable. Like if somebody plays these, I'm not like, oh, why is that in there? They play any yeah. of the other three, I would be very, I would question it because I mean, definitely the black one. I, I, I that card is like terrible. And the, I don't the even know what the black one does. Everyone's gonna be empty-handed for it to work. The, I mean, the other uh. thing to keep in mind is you only get to look at your top four cards, which isn't a ton. So the other like inconsistency is sometimes you like play your hideaway land and you see like land, land, mana rock, mana dork or something and. It's just kind of a tap land that it does in a basic land. So it's great when you hit your big expensive thing and you cast an eight drop for two mana. But that doesn't always happen, especially in a hundred card singleton deck that has like half of its lands or whatever. So odds are two of the things you can see are going to be, you know, some form of mana. And then the other two are going to be who knows what. So you're not guaranteed to have a good card under them, basically. But that's why their value has gone up because of MDFCs. It's true. Spike Field Hazard from under the under the hideaway or, land. Boom. Yeah, they got wow. yeah. because, so, so it's interesting, right? No, when we talk up. about oh, colorless yeah. lands, right? You have to rank how many other colorless lands you're playing because you can't just put all colorless lands in. Same with Enter the Battlefield Tapped. You can only play mm-hmm. so many ETB tap lands before it becomes a problem. So if you're playing a full suite of MDFCs and Triomes, like can you be playing this thing such that like all of your lands are now ETB tapped, right? Like with all the new utility lands, right? If we're playing Vesuva, Field of the Dead, Triome, MDFCs, like what are your untapped lands at this point? So even though these cards are strong, maybe you still have to cut them because you just cannot afford to run so many tapped lands. My like, would you cut this or still... an MDFC first? Right? Like you play so both. It's okay. an interesting you can have question. It all. You can I have mean, it all. I, yeah. My human. They're deck a tempo. They're a tempo loss always. But like, if I'm in a go wide deck, and you you told me like, all right, do I choose between Castle Arden Vale or Windbrisk Heights as as the utility <laughs> slot? The Windbrisk. I I windmill slam the Windbrisk Heights. Yes. I mean, like, yes, please. And you just have to attack with three things in a go wide deck. Like, come on now, that's easy. And it's card advantage, and you're white. You know, don't you want card advantage? And you cast it for free. Like, well, not free for one mana. Um, yeah, I, you leave Castle Arden Vale out of this. That card is gas. Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, I think there's one other pinch you didn't mention, Richard, where, like, sure, tap lands are a pinch, colorless lands are a pinch, but I also think we've reached the point where, like, non-basics that only tap for one color of mana, it's hard to play all the good ones in a lot of your decks, like with channel lands and MDFCs and castles. We're getting so many cycles of these lands that, like, function like a basic, essentially, except they're non-basics. That you just can't, I don't think you can play them all anymore, especially in like three color decks. It becomes very difficult because you also need some number of dual lands to actually make your mana work. So I think that's like the additional pinch. So there is like a relatively high opportunity cost now where there wasn't five years ago. Five years ago, you'd play win breast Heights every time because what else are you going to do? Like you might as well. But there's just so much more competition now that it, there's tough choices to be made. And I think there are decks where win breast Heights is the right card to play. Like I would probably play it over Castle Iron Veil and I go wide. Or I'd probably actually play both and just got a basic, but yeah, you know, that's just me. But, um, but no, yeah, that, that's so there us, are, Seth. <laughs> that's, that's us. us. That's me and Crim's technique. Um, so there are decks where I think they are the optimal ones, but I do think there's not a lot of room for lands like this anymore in most decks. There's competition for sure. Like, I won't run them always. Like, I, I used to run them a lot because I'm like, sweet card advantage in white and red. Wow. But now it's like, well, yeah, I already have card advantage. Um, I would like my land sent to the battlefield untapped, please. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I still think they're decent in some decks. All right, well, uh, moving on. We got a card that most people will agree that is pretty darn good. This is Reliquary Tower. It's a colorless land. Um, very, very simple. It's unt it enters the battlefield untapped. It taps for colorless. And it says you have no maximum hand size. Uh, this is a card that we play a lot on Commander. I think it's shown up in pre-cons. It's pretty popular in the format in general. Uh, me, Krim, Seth gave them all an A. And Richard, though, Richard gave it a B, which is not bad. Not B for bad. bad. B for, oh, okay. No, no, it's not bad. <laughs> so I put this on the list because I actually think this is probably the most overrated card of, like, all time. Like, everyone jams it in their deck with, like, sweet ambitions of, like, I'm going to rip 50 <laughs> cards off my library and I don't want to discard. But yeah. But how often does that really happen? Like, how many decks can actually draw like a full grip and i would argue it's very very small and you should probably play a colored source or a different utility land that adds utility and i think this is like the epitome of like theoretical use cases where i should put this in and it like hoses your mana base and like any <laughs> other utility land would do better so that's betrayed. my argument who can actually like draw over seven cards <laughs> and like keep keep you know, keep their hand. Have only, you heard the only of decks Toski? that are worth running? Yeah, Toski. There's every every color now has an engine. Every color has an engine. Now I do think that like I could just play. If I'm in blue, I may not need this because I could just play Seagate Restoration. Uh, but the the thing here is like yeah, like I think there are enough engines in all of Commander to where you can make this totally possible. Where I'm just like flooded with cards. I mean, I don't think you play it in every single deck. Uh, there's certainly decks that I play where I'm like, okay, the odds of me actually having more than seven cards in hand is so low that it's just not worth the cost. But I think there are enough mass draw spells, like Krim mentioned Toski being one of them, but there's so many things that generate card advantage now. R Ristic Study is another one. There's so many cards where you just end up with a lot of cards in hand that I think that that is worth it in a reasonable number of decks. Like, if I think there's some chance that I'm going to end up with more than seven cards, I'm probably just going to throw in a Reliquary Tower just, just because. It comes into play untapped. It is colorless, which is a drawback, as we've talked about before. But discarding a bunch of cards in hand side is just so... Ugh, so brutal <laughs> it's not fun it's not fun to draw a ton of cards and see a ton of sweet things and be like oh i'm gonna have to discard like half of these to hand size so even though it might not be optimal it's worth it to avoid like that painful situation is it overrated maybe who knows i i the answer though is like what if like you're not like what if you're in a deck that isn't gonna draw more cards to discard down the hand size uh, my answer to that is, is I wouldn't run such decks. Why would you run a deck that doesn't doesn't <laughs> have the risk of discarding down to hand size? That doesn't sound like commander to me. That's not the commander I want to play. So yes, I'll have this and I'll have a thought vessel on the side, please. Because I like drawing cards. And, and if I'm not drawing cards, and I mean, if I'm in blue, Seagate Restoration as well. So I ask you this, what kind of deck are you running where if you mass burst draw all your cards, 
that with the seven best cards, you cannot win the game. <laughs> Even if you, in the worst case scenario, discard to hand size. Like, I know it's what Kirby's gonna say. You need the 18 counter spells to force your win through, right? The like, little, I, a little win condition called Mech Titan, Richard, all right? I'm, I'm, and I'm, removing the process of having to discard so I don't have to choose which is the best card. I just don't have it all. Yeah. I mean, literally, didn't our last Commander Clash come down to both of you not having a maximum hand size and drawing 50 cards and you both needing it so you would be able to like fight this massive counter war. Like if either one of you discard the hand size there, I think you just auto lose and the other one auto wins. Well, no, because our and hand like, was like five counter spells and the one card we were trying to dig 50 <laughs> cards in our deck to get, right? <laughs> so like, yeah, oh, discard hand size didn't matter, right? I needed, them. Right? I needed yeah. them. What if I, I didn't want to discard all my lanes. So I need to make lane draws. So we had 50 oh. cards and we just we need one card to end the game, right? Like the other 49 <laughs> cards are like irrelevant, right? Just like backup counter magic. But I don't know. I think people are just overly. Um, it's like the war room argument, but the other way, right? Like you think you're going to get into the state where you're going to draw cards with war room. You're going to get into the state where you have 50 cards and they're all valuable and you need them. But like literally run any other, like a basic. Like, the ramp with Ishin probably would have been better than this theoretical, like, Reliquary Tower, right, Seth? I mean, I didn't have Reliquary Tower in that deck, just so it's clear, because I didn't think I was going to draw it up. But I think you are, I would agree with Richard that it's overrated. I do think that it's definitely not unplayable, but I do think that it's not a card you should just throw in every single deck that you build, and I think that's how a lot of people run it, because I think on EDH Rec, it's, like, maybe the number one most played card. I'm trying to look it up right now, but I think it's, like, second behind Bajuka Bog as far as utility lands, as far as how much you run it, and that is probably too much. So I think it is overrated, but it's still, I think, something that I'm going to run in a decent amount of decks if I think there's some chance I'm going to overdraw. What if I strip mine? It, would you be upset? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's the best. You know, like, oh, that's three a... cards in hand. Would you, would you wage <laughs> because all out You're planning more? ahead. You're that's... planning ahead. You're like, oh, I was going to oh. seek it. <laughs> that's another vote for strip mine because you can get their reliquary tower after they draw their cards yeah. and they get this card. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably it's probably a B, but I'm not I'm not putting it lower than A. I, I, I I'll, I'll bump it to B. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, uh, we we're going to talk about Field of the Dead. I'll just read it out for people. Enters the battlefield uh, tapped. Sasha Callus. Uh, when it or another lane enters the battlefield under your control, if you control seven or more lands with different names, you create a two-two black zombie creature token. If you don't know what this card is, just know that it's busted. We actually we all gave it an S. We Literally all gave it an S. This is the highest highest honors of any other thing. Uh, d I would I would say as far as the it's a design mistake, not yeah. cool. But like you should probably warp your entire land base to run it because it is that good. Uh, we're not gonna dwell too much on it, but like even if you're a mono color, like you probably this is a good reason to run less basics. You know, like this is mm -hmm. this is this is the more only M argument. More MDFCs. I, more MDFCs. This is the baby. only argument. I knew I was only argument. Right. This is, the, I this would, is why Arden is a good card. <laughs> turns yeah, this is it. This turns all these <laughs> these sub party totally lands into all stars. Yo, you ever Thanks. play both in the same deck though? You <laughs> laugh God. at my so power. Five make a one one. Play <laughs> so, a land, get a two two. <laughs> yeah, yeah you put them together. You put them together. Together, oh Crack my your, god! There's ugh. so much value. <laughs> so bad. This is exactly why Castle Arnville's garbage when you compare it to Field of Dead. <laughs> they five mana. Anyway, we're moving Ooh. on to something more interesting. Uh, Krim, tell us about uh, artifact lands. So I I came to realize this because I had recently just gotten my Shorakai, you know the the Gundam Mech Commander, right? So I'm like, okay. It's well, normally you assume artifact deck, you throw in the artifact lands, right? We're talking not not the ones from Modern Horizons. We're talking more along the lines of the the mono color ones, right? The ones that are not indestructible. Um, I, I cannot remember any of their names for the life of me. Just someone throw one out there, you got it. That's the one. Um, so yes. The artifact ancient den, sure. Um all of these lands used to just be where, okay, if you play if you play an artifact deck, just the the just on the sheer volume of artifacts you would have, right? It turns your whole deck on. So like naturally, you throw the artifact lands in. But this is weird for me because now I realize I started take. I actually didn't put any of them in because I feel like there's just so many things now that automatically kill an artifact when they enter the battlefield. They do so many like things like that, and like I can't tell you how many games where people are just like, well. Look, Krim, 
or look, X, Y, Z, I don't have another target and I just wanted to play this. So I'm going to blow up your land. I'm like, oh, well, that sucks. <laughs> okay. So I just feel like it's nice. Don't get me wrong. I love that you can tutor this with like, you know, uh, ran random other like things, right? Like a, whatever mage it is. You can tutor these up because they're still an artifact, yada, yada, yada. But I feel like the, the amount of times where that is a benefit is not enough to outweigh the sheer amount of artifact removal that exists in this format. Now, you could say, why play artifacts at all? Well, that's fine if you blow up my vehicle. That's fine if you blow up my, like, you know, whatever artifact permanent that I have that isn't a resource. Um, that it, Fast mana, I play with that, like, you know, kind of with the assumption it's getting blown up anyways. But my lands? Now, my lands, that's different. See, because like that, I can claw my way back in and rebuild if you blow up my mana rocks. I don't know if I can do that if my mana base is like Ancient Den and and all the other artifacts and those are all gone. And on and like, I mean, maybe if you're like me, I play Karn the Great Creator just because I know artifacts are popular. And I, I love how, and like in that deck, I can pull my artifacts to get exiled. Well, I mean, look, artifacts are everywhere, right? And how much funnier to the person playing Karn and not as funny to the person on the receiving end of it where your lands are shut off. So I just feel like oftentimes I'm okay with certain things being artifacts, except my resources, my main resources. So I personally do not play, uh, like I'm starting to take these out of most of my decks now that are artifact decks. Uh, the whole group's got them kind of ranked separately once I find them. What, where, where, does anyone have these ranked? Every, everyone... Everyone has it a B, but, like, I'm slowly... Tr I'm trending down, right? I am trending down. Like, it is, like, more of, like, a C to C-. minus. Um, So, like, I I'm going to change that right now because I've noticed I've just stopped playing them. And I'm curious if these are still auto-includes in the year 2022 when everything blows up an artifact. I mean, I think if... I mean, I have it as a B because I think if you're playing a Artifact Matters Commander, I, I still view them as, uh, like, auto-includes. Like, if you're playing Saheeli the Gifted, and this is double-ramping you, or Ozgear, and this is, or you know, double-ramping you, like, there's enough of these synergies that I think are strong enough that it's worth the risk in those cases. Um, I don't know if I would just play it in, like, uh, like I don't... There's, there's got to be a cutoff. Is pumping a Kiri enough to be worth the risk of playing an Artifact Land... Maybe not. So I guess maybe it's trending down a little bit for me. I do. I agree with what you're saying. Like in general, there is a lot of punishment for artifacts and we keep getting more. We just got farewell. That's another like mass, you know, exile for artifacts. So I definitely agree with what you're saying, but I still think there's enough artifact matter commanders where they're just so powerful that it makes up for for that risk in those like specific decks. I downgraded to a C because it happened to me recently. I built an artifact deck and I'm like, I can't put these lands in. Right. And we just had that discussion. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think it's worth any upside to like, you know, even if your commander is focused on this, like you will, it will get removed. <laughs> right. And like, it's not like, just like play a Lotus pedal or something. Right. Like, I don't know. Like, or here in this situation, play a basic. Yeah. I would it's, agree. It's there. not worth that little extra, you know, boost you get with the fact that it's going to get destroyed. Like, you know, like already mana rocks are dodgy, right? And like, you know, people didn't like to play like um, mana dorks because they get removed, right? Like this is your land drop. It's important, right? Like if you could play an indestructible one, uh, indestructible one, like a basic land, like you should play it, right? Like, so I will play like Dark Steel. Citadel, whatever the indestructible one land uh, land is, the the dual lands. If you're in those colors, uh, those ones make sense. But this is like too too YOLO for me, right? Like I don't think I can win with this incremental advantage, and I will get blown out by it. So it's not worth. I I view these exactly the same as how I view Dryad Arbor. Like at the high the higher power your deck, uh, the more. Uh, interesting and, and usable these cards are because the more explosive your deck is, the less window of opportunity your opponents have to punish you for it. Um, and, you know, uh, having an affinity count or whatever, you know, uh, is useful. Being able to sacrifice this to your goblin welder is useful. Uh, if you're like Osgear and you can copy it, you know, make tokens out of it, it is useful. So, like, the more the more powerful my deck is, the more the, the quicker I want to end the game, um, the more likely I'm going to be running these artifact lands. If I'm running like an artifact deck that is mid power, which 
I guess those exist, but like artifacts are usually just like a very high power archetype that like, yeah, they're naturally, it's like, it's like, do you have a mid power Brea deck? No, it doesn't exist. Um, Problem is the higher power you are, the more likely people have answers to this stuff. Like the higher power you are, the more likely they'll null rod you, right? Like, so it's like a little sketchy, right? True. Like the higher power, they'll have a collector oofs and stuff like that because they have to, right? Like you have to, you have to have those answers. But I still think it's still worth it. Like the the amount of answers they'll have versus the the explosive potential. I still think it's. I'm still going to be running it. Like I ran I ran the artifact lands on my Shurikai list in Commander Clash. Uh, even knowing that all of you are packing farewell or whatever wouldn't change my opinion on it because my deck was busted. I wanted to do broken things. And I wasn't planning for like five turns in advance. I was planning for my next one to two turns. And the, uh, I felt like I got enough synergy value out of uh, playing Artifact Lands that it's worth it, even even knowing the risks. Uh, but like, if I was playing a more fair Artifact deck, then yeah, I'm not going to run it. I don't know. So I think it's B. I, I ranked Dryden Arbor B, and I, I view this exact same way. But yeah, that that's it. We, we covered a lot, and we're, we're pushing almost... Almost two hours, oh boy, an hour and 40. Um, so hopefully you all enjoyed that big talk about utility lands. We got some hot takes. Um, oh, we would definitely want to hear from you all. Uh, what do you think about these these lands? And if you're interested in seeing all of our grades, we obviously there's way too many utility lands to ever talk about. And there was some stuff that we just thought wasn't going to be good discussion. Like we all think the channel lands from Neon Dynasty, Kamigawa are fantastic. We didn't need to have a podcast and about Arden that. Vale. But we still talked about it. Well, well, kind of. Okay. Card's good. Um, yeah, I know. I agree. <laughs> anyway, uh, like and subscribe if you en- enjoy this sort of stuff. We'll be back next week with, I don't know, something else. Uh, I didn't think this far. Anyway, that's it, everybody. Hope you all enjoyed. Until next time, friends. See ya.